This program will include interviews with Mr. and Mrs. Shaw from Schenectady, New York, and Dr. Hoshang Barucha, who has just arrived from India. They are all long-term disciples of Meher Baba. Darwin Shaw will tell us about Meher Baba. As you know, Meher Baba brought the West and the East together through the message of love. Mr. Darwin Shaw, would you please tell us something about Meher Baba? I'd be delighted. Actually, I've known about Meher Baba since 1932 and have been with him many times, both in America and in India. And uh, my experiences with him are beyond the terminology of remarkable and been exposed to the impact of the divine love that radiated from him all the time was something that is simply overwhelming. Uh, we, we were with him on so many occasions when we had the opportunity to uh, see him working with people of all classes, uh, of all stratas of life, and uh, to see the divine love and its reaction upon people uh, was something that uh, uh, one would expect to find in an incarnation of the divine. Regarding him as the divine beloved incarnate is no exaggeration. I recall very well one of the first meetings with Baba here in New York City in the year of 1934. It was at the Shelton Hotel and we had this opportunity to see him in his room, his suite of rooms. And he wore this beautiful Indian sadra and at that time of course he had long hair and a flourishing mustache and he, his eyes were so beautiful and filled with love. And when we came into this room, it was such a glorious afternoon experience with him. I came to him as one comes to Christ, and that is indeed whom I found there. He had us sit around him, and I know that I wanted to be very close to him. And I sort of sat on my haunches, rather on my knees, and leaned back down my heels in front of him where I could look up into his beautiful eyes and uh, although he was silent and had been remaining silent for many years this was part of his of his uh, active manifestation to be silent and uh, leading up to the breaking of his silence and giving forth the one divine word although he was Verbally silent, he communicated by means of gestures and an alphabet board, and he spoke to us of love, naturally one would expect him to, and this is what he did. He spoke to us of loving God, of loving one's fellow man. And we were exposed to, for the first time to the impact of this glorious, indescribably beautiful love, dynamically powerful, radiant, luminous, heart-opening, soul-saving love. <clears throat> and we discovered very shortly that he knew all of our thoughts and feelings instantaneously. During the course of this first interview, the thought crossed my mind, this is such a glorious experience, so incredible. I wish I had some little thing as a memento of this wonderful occasion. And immediately Baba snapped his fingers and had his Indian secretary, Dadachanji, bring a rose. And to my delight and amazement, he took off a petal and handed to each one of us to keep as a memento for this occasion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, a few days later, we saw him in the midst of a large uh, uh, a gathering when several hundred people had come to see him for short contacts. Uh, and uh, we had the opportunity to be with him or near him to see him for maybe two and a half or three hours and as we sat there and we were in his presence during that time 
we began to become more and more imbued with this great love so that we, by the time the afternoon was over with, we were quite literally intoxicated with that great love. It was really something. And of course, in subsequent times, we saw him uh, in 1952 here in America, and I had the very good fortune to be one of some 17 Western men who were invited to be his guests for what was later described as three incredible weeks in India with Meher Baba. And there, uh, I must say that the experiences we had from day to day were so far beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Uh, each day seemed like living, vitally alive, vibrantly alive, pages of a new New Testament that were unfolding, and we were a part of this experience, this great experience. We saw him with vast multitudes there, 60 to 70,000 people in a single day coming to see him, to have their contact with him. People of all faiths and of all stratas of life coming to have some little contact with him. Uh, I had come to think that this was a tremendously important spiritual age in which we are living, and that such a one as Jesus would be putting in his appearance. And this was all intuitive, mind you. And I had come to feel that uh, early in the 30s that uh, I would know about it, and that somehow I would uh, get to see him wherever he was and somehow go there. And sure enough, when I first heard about Meher Baba in 1932, and uh, it was just... Where did you see him? I actually didn't meet him until two years later in New York City in 1934, but 32 was my first uh, contact with him. There was an exchange of, of correspondence. There was an inner meeting, more than one, in the spirit, as it were. And, uh, of course, actually meeting him in the physical confirmed everything I felt in the spirit, that he really was and is the Divine Beloved Incarnate. Uh, what actually influenced you to see Meher Baba and to, or to go and uh, meet him in person? I think it's the same urge that many thousands of people are continuously having, that urge to find the true meaning of life, to find uh, actually God himself. I know my feeling had always been, if there is a God, I, w I must know it. I must find him. If there isn't, I don't want to be deluded. Fortunately, there is a God, and I did find him. We have also tonight a very distinguished lady, Mrs. Jean Shaw, who is also a disciple of Meher Baba, the compassionate father. We would like to know something about Meher Baba from her as well. Uh, Jean Shaw, when were you there to see Baba? I first heard of him in 1932, but I also met him for the first time uh, with my husband. I was just a young mother in the 20s, and I didn't know too much about uh, the God-man, but I was raised a Christian, and I loved God very much as a child and all the way through, very devout. And, and uh, the first literature we had was uh, and were the discourses, and, and it seemed to me as if I knew the discourses already, and it all seemed so familiar. And, of course, I always thought of him as Master uh, and Baba. I didn't know of him as the Avatar then. And I read so much about divine love, but it never occurred to me to question what is divine love, because it was beyond me. I, and But when I met Baba, then I felt what divine love is. And it's, uh, someone asked me what it was like, I said, well, I can only say you melt. <laughs> you melt when you feel that flame of uh, Baba's love. And I knew what love was of a father and a mother, and then my love for my children. 
I knew uh, I had a, I had children and and I was expecting, and then um, I knew what uh, love uh, for God was, where I was brought up, and and love of uh, uh, father, mother, children, husband. But when I met Baba, that was something else. It was such a indescribable melting feeling that uh, it was so uplifting. And uh, it was like coming home to the, to my real father. And then later, when I uh, saw him again in '52, that was a that '52 stands out in my mind too. So great because I never knew that uh, the experience of extrasensory perception or things like that, or having uh, to pick up thoughts, and these things were happening within me for the first time. And uh, then I begin to know that in that love, there's knowledge. You know things, and you don't know, you haven't learned it, and no one has taught it to you, and, and you suddenly, these centers open up, and you know things that you haven't been told. But, uh, and I also saw Baba's power, but with me, he was always very gentle, and I always saw just a love aspect. And, of course, our children all became lovers of Baba. We didn't push it, and we didn't try to uh, convert them, and they were just brought up with it naturally. And they, on their own, they wanted to read about him, and they waited till 1952 before they met him. And so when Baba uh, put up his hand, it meant he wanted the five shawls. And so it was always the five shaws, and and when we talked about having meetings, uh, he said, "Don't worry if there isn't uh, anyone coming, because there's always if there's five gathered together in my name. There I am, too. My presence is there, and so it has been that way. And even if no one came, there were always the five shaws, and we had a meeting. Uh, the greatest thing I think anyone could experience is to have. Uh, the physical contact with him in, in human form. Rarely he does take incarnation as a human being to come to our level, to give us the actual physical experience of God's personal love for the individuals in his own creation. He always told us, of course, I am not this body, and uh, someday you will come to see me as I really am. And at the time this seemed far beyond us because we couldn't imagine anything more beautiful or more wonderful than he was as we saw him. But he said, in reality, this is simply a cloak I wear to come to your level. In reality, I am infinite consciousness. I am one with everyone and everything. And his whole mission was to awaken, not to teach, but to awaken, to help us to become aware of the truth which he says is latent within everyone and to bring forth a new dispensation of divine love and truth, to reveal once again and, and much more extensively the possibilities of spiritual experience for people anywhere and everywhere, of any faith and of every faith, and to show them that there is this one God for all people, and that he really is the God of love, and that he really is beautiful. <laughs> Would you please tell us why Baba observed silence? Yes, starting in 1925, Mayor Baba stopped speaking and started uh, communicating by means of signs made with his hands and uh, eventually an, a little alphabet board was made up and he would point to the letters and digits on this board to communicate and one of his close disciples would uh, read his uh, writing on the board and speak it out, you see. And uh, this, through the years, was a very enigmatic thing for him to have done. Actually, his silence, which began in 1925, continued until the end of his physical life in 1969. And uh, uh, he referred to this very frequently, and it was always a point of great interest that he said that uh, from, from time to time that he would be breaking his silence and that it would be a tremendously significant thing when he did break his silence, and that it would react and have its purpose uh, throughout the world and on all planes. But most of all, uh, I know there are differences in opinion about the true significance of this silence, and I don't think it can be uh, boiled down to a simple 
uh, uh, conclusion because I think there are, there are many answers that it, uh, that it really was a work that uh, functioned on, on many planes. But uh, one of the most important uh, conclusions I feel with regard to his silence uh, was and is that it, uh, it reflected the silence of God. Um, and it, it, was a fair, it was actually a form of speaking. You see, he often said, I have come not to teach, but to awaken. Awaken what? To awaken something within. You see, the intuition, uh, we must take a step beyond reason and begin to have intuition function, to reach, to reach with what? With the heart, with the spirit and to have the heart awakened. Of course, this was his work, to awaken the heart so that it functioned. He could set an individual on fire with love. I know because I've had this happen uh, on several occasions. Uh, not just an individual, but many individuals. How far and how many at once, I have no idea. But uh, as a personal experience, I know that I have sat before him and uh, I don't know what he did. But simply the radiance and the beauty of his love inspired one so much that uh, one actually became consumed, really consumed with love. <coughs> From the first hand class, which, which felt as though it might have been coming down and reaching toward me through thousands of years, and the first look into those deep pools of divine love, which were his beautiful brown eyes, and to feel uh, and to become and wrapped in the bliss of that first embrace was something that uh, I could scarcely even begin to describe, but it seemed to uh, put one into a, uh, immediately into a, a state of, of, of great inner freedom, great joy, great bliss, great inner happiness. Uh, I don't mean by that that we were suddenly uh, put into the position of, of having these things at an abiding uh, as an abiding experience. Like anyone else, we, we would have these contacts within these wonderful contacts, uh, but then we would have to struggle with our own problems, but inwardly learn to bring them to him. On many occasions he told us, bring everything to me, give everything to me, don't hold anything back, all of your pains and all of your pleasures, give everything to Bama. you see. And he said, don't worry, do your best, don't worry, and be happy in my love. That's a great yes, you see. And this giving everything to him is giving everything to God. Giving everything, not holding anything back, you see. And uh, we found that through the years, through thinking of him, through loving him, that little by little there were breakthroughs to new, new dimensions of inner freedom, inner beauty, and these have become sustained so that uh, through his love and through his grace, I feel that we have experienced some measure of true spiritual redemption. You see, as the avatar, his life included much inner suffering, which he voluntarily took upon himself for humanity. He did not get involved with the karma of humanity, but through his suffering, he took upon himself the suffering of the world, which was the result of his, its karma. And through his vicarious suffering, humanity finds its redemption. He not only was for all humanity, but continues to be for all humanity, for those living now who think of him and inwardly reach out toward him. There is this possibility, which is very uh, vibrantly real and alive, of not only contacting him in the personal sense, but in his infinite sense, the infinite reality. The living form, this beautiful living form of the avatar, is the doorway to the infinite. This is why he takes incarnation, so that we will have a doorway to reach through uh, beyond our own limited dimensions and into the reality of God himself. He said, if you love me at your level, I will take you to my level. Uh, since Baba has dropped his body, uh, how do you feel that he's still present or he's with you? Do you feel like that or how do you feel about it now? Yes, this is a very important question. 
Uh, you know, even while he was in the physical body, and beautiful and wonderful though he was in that physical body, he would often say, I am not this body. It is simply a cloak I wear in order to come to you so that you can see me. I am really infinite consciousness. And through the years with him, he taught us a deep inner confidence in our inner communication with him. We discovered that we really did have a, a vital and very valid inner communication with him, even though at times we were separated from him physically by many, many thousands of miles. And we were meant to learn this, to learn that through a very personal inner contact with him, we would be developing the ability to establish a real, a vital, a living, very valid contact with him in his infinite sense, as infinite consciousness. But we need this doorway. We feel that, uh, I know that I feel that he is every, mu every bit as much alive as he ever was when in the physical body. I feel his direction and the, the, the importance of, of uh, the message which he came to give, that we should strive more and more to love God, that loving God is really the sole purpose of life, to find God, to love him, and to surrender all to him, you see. Uh, actually, he came to explain that life is truly a spiritual experience, that all, sooner or later, will be impelled to, to seek, to consciously seek the spiritual reality. And although there, there are other masters, there are perfect masters in the world at all times. For us, who have had this, this supremely important contact with him as the avatar, he is the avenue for us. He is the way and the goal. And this is a marvelous thing. They aren't separate, separated from each other. He himself is the way and the goal. And it's very similar to what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> there is no separation. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. He also said, ye are gods, if you will have it. And this is what Baba has come to reveal, that in our true nature, we are not these physical bodies, that we too, when realized, will discover that we are part of God.